when people feel uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon for wherever you're at. My name is Josh Fox Fuller, and I'm one of the No Neuropsychology Committee members. Um, we're very pleased that you could join us today for this week's lecture on volume two of the 12 week No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early uh, career neuropsychologists to provide um, didactic opportunities um, to individuals free of cost. Um, we would like to thank our sponsors, uh, or here's the committee here, and we'd like to thank our sponsors um, for their continued support of our initiative. Before we start, we have a few disclaimers for the series. Um, first and foremost, the training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are entirely their own. Um, any questions that you have during the talk can be submitted to the Q&A box on the lower left side of your screen, and the recording for today's lecture is going to be recorded. Um, the No Neuropsychology um, is, uh, Initiative is also dedicated to our commitment to diversity throughout our lecture series, and more information about this can be found on our website. So today, I'm very excited to welcome you to our, um, our event on no neuropsychology around the world. Um, we have two panelists joining us today, Dr. Ayal Judy from Saudi Arabia and Dr. Johnny Kanga, who's at Emory and also is um, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. So our first speaker will be Dr. Al Judy today. Um, she is a Saudi raised and US trained US clinical or a clinical psychologist who specializes in neuropsychological assessment. She earned her bachelor's degree from King Saudi University and then worked for three years in neuropsychological assessment at a major Saudi Arabian hospitals in the Riyadh area. She then moved to the United States to pursue her, her postgraduate education, earning her doctorate degree at Widener University with a specialty in neuropsychology. And then she completed her two year postdoctoral residency in clinical neuropsychology at John Hopkins. And there at John Hopkins under supervision of world renowned neuropsychologists, she assessed candidates for epilepsy and Parkinson's disease surgeries, as well as patients with suspected dementia. Um, she now, she's also conducted a lot of research in these domains as well. And she now has moved back to Saudi Arabia and is working as a clinical neuropsychologist at King Fazul Specialist Hospital in Riyadh. And she has been assessing a wide variety of neurodevelopmental and disorders and performing epilepsy and PD pre-surgical evaluations there as well. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and let Dr. Al Judy share her screen and she will take it away. Thanks, Josh. Um, sharing my slides. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be um, invited for this uh, type of lectures. Um, I'm very proud of the efforts that everyone is putting uh, in this. Um, and um, I'll do my best to uh, represent and um, describe uh, neuropsychology in my area, uh, in, which is Saudi Arabia. I will um, talk a little bit about that and uh, also a little bit ab about um, uh, adaptation uh, of uh, tests into uh, the Arabic culture and the Arabic language, which is uh, a passion of mine. So we'll start with uh, what's going on in Saudi Arabia. And I want to make sure uh, to um, uh, point out that this is totally anecdotal data. There's no studies that been uh, uh, revealing these kind of um, data. Uh, it's just me being um, a, a Saudi who was born and raised in the area. Um, I, I also did my um, undergrad here in Saudi and some uh, training slash um, practice after that um, as, a, as a assistant level. Uh, as and then uh, getting my education in the U.S. Uh, so the, and, and coming back and working for around five years. So uh, so this is coming from that. Um, later, I'm going to be be more scientific and, and uh, talk about more data, uh, especially when it comes to test uh, development and adaptation. So what I'm seeing in Saudi Arabia right now is that um, there has been um, a giant developments in the past 
10 years compared to the, to the 90s, 80s, and, and the 70s. Uh, other countries in the 70s, uh, other booming countries like Egypt and uh, Iraq were uh, actually leading uh, in the area of uh, psychological assessment where uh, maybe they were going uh, like uh, par to par with Western cultures uh, and being developed at that time, having a lot of cognitive uh, type of tests uh, available to the public and to the cl for clinical use, whereas Saudi was not uh, there at that time. Um, and, uh, and even Saudi publications uh, it has been really booming since the year, uh, starting from around 2000 and uh, really picking up uh, until now uh, in the area of mental health. Uh, and that has been uh, going side by side with the advancement in medical uh, um, education and training. And like in Saudi Arabia, medical hospitals and institutions has been ranking uh, high uh, in, in the Middle East uh, overall, and a little bit in the world, like not hiking, not ranking very extremely high, but it's been like a competing uh, um, a realm uh, or industry, and or I wouldn't call it an industry, but a field. In, uh, uh, so when we say Saudi Arabia, we uh, we could count on medical um, services being uh, up to par, up to international cars, let's say. Uh, however, psychology has been emerging a little bit. Uh, and uh, what that's coming from is some uh, associations from past, uh, like a meta, a past um, historical or political environments where psychology was associated with Freud. And then Freud was all about at least to, to to them or to, to what was uh, received by that time associated with sexual energy, um, sexual development, um, these kind of explanations of human behavior, which really put off um, some kind of uh, political, um, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, vibes that were going on at the same time and like uh, take, uh, that was dominating also at the same time. Therefore, psychology was uh, uh, first um, categorized as a uh, literary field in college. So when we go to college, we, we psychology is under um, the uh, literally uh, uh, the art college where and literal uh, and uh, literal and art college where uh, you would see uh, history and a little bit of philosophy and geography. So psychology was under that uh, college. Um, and um, the, uh, the, uh, the psychological education was confined and the, when it comes to practice at uh, past uh, days, Islamic counseling, similar to Christian counseling, was, was dominating uh, in the practice. Psychiatry uh, benefited a little bit from the advancement in medicine, whereas psychology uh, continued to battle uh, these old uh, uh, problems. Uh, therefore, this affected academia majorly. So you, you, you might be surprised with the numbers, and I, I try to be very, very mm, uh, generous and giving higher range uh, than I would personally think, but, you know, I just based on my knowledge, I want to be uh, as accurate as possible, so I'm giving a high confidence interval. So for academic problems, uh, what I know in Saudi, from my uh, experience that in, in, in masters, uh, we would, uh, in clinical psychology, there's no more than five programs. Uh, that's in terms of master's level. Uh, we, didn't get, uh, we didn't even get to doctorate. Maybe there were a doctorate in the past, but uh, uh, currently not, uh, there's, there's no known, to my knowledge, uh, program. Uh, masters in counseling, but uh, on the other hand, are, uh, uh, more prevalent. <clears throat> so when it comes to a PhD, I would imagine there might maybe zero to four. Um, so, and, and I'm talking about clinical psychology here, uh, let alone the specialty of clinical neuropsychology. So you see the dilemma is coming from establishing a, a, a really good clinical psychology uh, graduate program 
and then have offering the specialty of neuropsychology. Uh, so nearly all Saudi doctoral graduates in psychology have graduated from Western countries or neighboring Arab countries like Egypt and Lebanon and Jordan, where uh, the psychology practices were not as confined in the past, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and again, I'm going to repeat, this is what I'm seeing right now. Um, based on the <laughs> CV and the experiences and the education uh, and the practice in the field that I've just talked about, uh, but I could be wrong and they could be like newer development, but based on all these years, I'm seeing roughly only 20% neuropsychological evaluations conducted by graduates of clinical psychology programs. Uh, and, the, and there people specialize in assessment, either in internship or in doctoral curriculum. Uh, the, the concept of, four of, of a postdoctoral training in clinical psychology is totally new uh, in Saudi Arabia and I would imagine in many Arabic countries. Uh, Saudi psychologists with postdoctoral training in clinical psychology overall in a country that has around 34 million people today uh, is, I would imagine, would be less than 10 or even maybe less than 5. Uh, in talking about a postdoctoral training, uh, let alone clinical neuropsychology training. What is common and what have been uh, picking up the need so far since I would say 10 or 15 years ago um, is the uh, when uh, is neuropsychological evaluation conducted by cognitive psychology scientists or behavior neuroscientists. Uh, those are people with PhD earned mainly from European countries. Uh, and we know like it, uh, Europe might be different than from US where uh, because they would do uh, go heavily on research first and then training, whereas the whereas neuropsychology might be, uh, sorry, whereas uh, the US might be uh, more practice based and then uh, research, depending if it was a PhD or PsyD, that would be uh, encouraged later on. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, or, or from neighboring Arab countries. So these uh, PhD holders uh, may have some formal training uh, during or after the PhD in um, uh, clinical psychology or clinical neuropsychology, or maybe simply not. They, they, we, I've seen uh, people with PhD who are like completely scientists and uh, maybe have trainings or observation periods here and there, and then started testing uh, people um, in clinical settings, which is a bit concerning. Okay, uh, so um, when it comes to service centers, I wanna give an overview of uh, what I think is going on before uh, talking about the test adaptation or test translation issue. Um, so uh, the these points of, uh, points where neuropsychological services are offered are grossly limited to three main metropolitan uh, areas in Saudi Arabia. And this is also could be true for uh, medicine. Uh, we, uh, we do have, it, it's, a, it's a vast country, huge, but we do have these like groups um, of, of uh, better medical services uh, around the country. Uh, the main one is the uh, um, capital, Riyadh, uh, my estimation, and again, this is completely an estimation, I would imagine four to six governmental hospitals that would provide clinical neuropsychological assessment for their patients, like a, a complete good neuropsychological assessment. Uh, private is also picking up right now uh, really well. I would imagine three to five, uh, not more. Uh, Jeddah area, which is in the West, uh, I know of two to four, uh, maximum four governmental hospitals who would provide that service. Also, um, the group practices could be even more uh, booming than I would imagine. And the Eastern uh, province where also we will find uh, uh, governmental hospitals and institutions uh, and some university uh, based hospitals uh, that would, who would uh, offer, that would offer uh, this service. And then the, also the private practice is developing. But uh, overall, it, it is uh, not very, does not cover the 
and the need of the entire country. So um, sources of referral or people who would ask us to uh, see patients for a neuropsychological evaluations um, and the reasons. So this is like kind of a mishmash between the, the patient population and the reason of referral together. Uh, I think this is a, a, the best and most accurate uh, picture I could come up. And um, the bigger it is, uh, the, the more need it is and the more we're asked. Uh, from my perspective, I feel underdevelopmental uh, has been um, uh, requested so much in Saudi Arabia and in my own practice um, because um, the like more than half of the country is uh, under the age of 16 or 18, something like that. And uh, people are becoming more aware, parents are becoming more aware, so they would see their child being a bit different than other children or not picking up at school. So they would see the need of a good uh, psychoeducational or neuropsychological evaluation or just cognitive, just knowing like what is my child's cognitive uh, strengths and limitations. Uh, so uh, this has been uh, really uh, requested a lot. Um, and then uh, in, in large centers, so this is a national need uh, as far as I see. And the, in large centers, we would see pre-surgical for epilepsy, also uh, specific centers, not all hospitals in Saudi, I would say um, two in Riyadh or and two in the Eastern province or something like that. Uh, also one um, maybe in, in the West. Um, but it is, you know, for medical legal uh, purposes, you know, epilepsy surgery has always been associated with uh, a, a neuropsychological assessment pre and better yet, uh, and also when possible, uh, post-surgical. Um, so this is kind of like more of a, 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 a priority for uh, hospitals. There's also uh, DBS surgeries has been also picking up and we're getting more of that, uh, even a little bit more than uh, because maybe of its ease and surgeons are, um, surgeons uh, to doing DBS surgeries. It's easier for neurosurgeons to do DBS surgeries than uh, epilepsy surgeries and maybe their numbers in Saudi. So we're getting a little bit more of that. Um, and then we're getting less of MS and less of, uh, uh, um, Alzheimer's or, or amnestic MCI question type of uh, referrals for neuropsychological assessment. Uh, legal uh, has been not going to a lot to neuropsychologists. It's been going to uh, neurologists and psychiatrists. Again, the awareness has not been very uh, in the legal system in the whole country. It has been not been um, cognitive function has been not associated with a clinical neuropsychologist yet. Uh, so we're getting less of those. Dr. Al, yeah, I, just want, I just want to hop in for one second, um, just about five to six minutes more. So if you want to hop forward to some of the adaptation work, and we can discuss more of this at the Q&A at the end, okay? Thank yeah. you. Uh, so um, these are, are reasons that we all, um, that all, all, most of us know uh, through our education or our um, practice, but uh, there are several reasons why we need to have a test specific to a certain culture. Uh, for Arabs, Arabs in specific, um, especially in the domains of uh, executive function and, pr and processing speed, uh, and visual spatial uh, functioning, uh, there has been numerous studies showing differences between either Arabs and Westerns or Arabs or Israelis uh, in these kind of uh, tasks. So these are just some examples. Uh, also education uh, is higher in Saudi uh, than Western countries, not, not entirely, uh, it's a high rate in the whole world, but. Uh, this is something, it is, we see patients, we expect patients to have no education uh, at some time, some of the elderly. Uh, it's rare, but uh, we know that this could look like brain damage uh, from studies on Latinos or uh, on white 
um, participants where uh, they perform the healthy uh, uh, people uh, without, uh, but they are like uh, of an, a different ethnic uh, uh, minority might perform as as a as same as a brain a person with a brain damage who is white. So it could look it could have a big effect. Uh, so why not use language-free tasks, especially for neuropsychology in Saudi Arabia? Uh, because it, it's easier to just use nonverbal tests, but uh, this disregards a hysterical string. Uh, string. Uh, Arabs as a nation are highly verbal. Um, some argue that Arabic is one of the richest in the world. Some say that it has uh, 12 million words, uh, whereas other uh, are, are less, but I didn't look at the uh, quality of these studies. Um, many take uh, pride in their language skills. Arabs like to recite religious scripts accurately, and they take pride on doing that, uh, compo composing poetry, even as, uh, uh, and, and memorizing it, even uh, as toddlers. Uh, one, a series of studies in Israel uh, compared between Bedouin Palestinians and um, uh, Israelis showed that the, the Bedouin Palestinians have consistently shows, uh, showed a relatively uh, superior verbal IQ compared to uh, uh, their counterparts. Um, why not just use nonverbal tests? Um, this has been debunked before uh, that they are culturally free. Uh, it, it, and one example spe specifically for Saudis is um, uh, some elderly uh, who are illiterate may never held a pencil in their life. Some children who just le lived a, a nomadic life in the desert um, have never seen a block before. So giving a, a nonverbal test wouldn't uh, make sense. Uh, why can't we use old Arabic tests? Um, there's the Flint effect where uh, massive IQ gains is expected based on that uh, study. Um, and, and there's so many uh, 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 variables that change nutrition, occupational status, uh, exposure to technology and urbanization. And I say that because in the 70s and 80s, um, a lot of Egyptian and uh, um, and uh, Iraqi tests were developed, but, uh, and people have been using it in Saudi Arabia since then. Uh, so um, using old norms uh, could be problematic due to that reason. Uh, so what, what uh, can Saudi clinicians do? Uh, they are limited to three options. Uh, I use new tests and norms, but that are not developed in Saudi, let's say you don't have a Saudi test, use it from an, uh, other Arab countries. Um, that is also normed to the other Arab countries, so they have like a similar dialect. Uh, adapt international tests to Saudis and attempt establishing psychometric properties or develop tests from scratch based on the local culture, culture and common vernacular. Uh, there's a study, uh, a review of neuropsychological tests that I, um, and, and a group of uh, investigators um, did in 2017. Um, and the results were that, uh, the t and, and for Arabs, the tests with most extensive use, adaptation, validation, norming were identified. Raven uh, matrices were the most uh, prevalent test uh, in all Arab countries. Um, and uh, the rate of neuropsychology publications for Arab countries combined per year was less that of uh, was less than half of that of American publications. Uh, but it really increased after 20, uh, 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 2010. Uh, approximately, approximately half of the publications did not employ cognitive tests that were standardized according to international guidelines or psychological measurement. So basically they were mainly translated or not normed, but they just use it for their publications. And a lot of people used nonverbal tests to, uh, at the expense of verbal uh, tests. Um, uh, some countries were better than others. I'm gonna skip that. This is an example of, uh, of uh, I just used cognitive screens here. 
Uh, so, um, and then I, I used, uh, and, and we uh, identified them of meeting how many criteria. So like translate, T is for translation, B, T is back translation, adaptation. So for, for Arabs, so the entire, entire uh, Arabic publications based on our uh, search criteria, uh, these are the tests that uh, uh, came up strong. Um, and you could see they're from different countries. And these Dr. are only- oh, Dr. Yeah. I have one question. Um, I just wanna make sure we have time for Dr. Ikanga to present because we're almost halfway through the hour. Um, right. Can you show that Word document really quickly, though? Because I think the Word document summarizes this, right? <laughs> to a uh, way. Right. The Word document is just a list of uh, Saudi tests. Um, so um, I'll go ahead and do that. Yeah, that would be good. Um, and I think what we can do, I think this is a common theme across both your work and Dr. Ikonga's work of the kind of the adaptation and translation to different um, cultures and languages from sort of the Western tests. Um, so maybe we can talk about that in a sort of syn uh, synthesis way at the end. But yeah, if you sure. want to share that um, word doc, that'd be great. Okay. Right. Uh, so this is just a list of what we found in the interview. Uh, uh, does that show? Yeah, we can see that. That looks great. So these are the tests where there's evidence for adaptation and translation, correct? Uh, uh, actually, this, these are the only Saudi uh, uh, these are only Saudi tests uh, from the review because it has so many uh, countries okay. and the ones with the best adaptation would have these letters okay. like so many uh, of those letters so but there's not many that they would okay. and I'm going to go to conclusions uh, after that. Okay is this uh, just out of curiosity is this a document that you can share with us because maybe we'll put it on the website as like an addendum. Okay great. Uh, okay. Awesome. Yeah, Okay, let's let's then move on if that's um, to Dr. Ikanga, just because I think I want to make sure that we get the two perspectives, because um, I think your work is very complementary in many ways, um, which is why we chose both of you to do that. So we'll have a little time at the end for Q and A, like ten to fifteen minutes. Um, but thank you for that presentation and um, giving us a background on sort of where the field is in Saudi Arabia and sort of where it's going. Um, Dr. Ikanga now will be our next presenter um, for the next fifteen or twenty minutes. Um, and then we'll have time at the end for everybody who's in attendance for Q&A. So Dr. Kanga is a pioneering researcher in collision in the field of cognitive and biological markers of Alzheimer's and other dementias in Sub-Saharan Africa, and especially in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He is currently a staff scientist at the Emory University School of Medicine and an assistant professor at the University of Kinshasa School of Medicine in the DRC. He got his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Detroit Mercy in Detroit, Michigan, and he completed his internship and postdoc fellowship at Emory. Uh, he's done a lot of work there with Dr. Anthony Stringer, uh, who's a strong mentor of his, and he has a strong interest in ascertaining the validity and the cultural relevance of English language neurocognitive tests normed in the Western uh, countries for the diagnosis of neurological disorders in the, in the CNS in Sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, he's also worked to translate many tests into French and many of the regional African languages, such as Swahili, to advance this line of research that he's interested in. And he's published many numerous peer-reviewed studies on um, including several articles about the African neuropsychological battery. Um, so Dr. Kanga, I'll let you take it away for our next part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, and thank you for to everyone. Let me make sure that uh, okay. Oh, I'm trying to see where. Oh. oh, slideshow. Okay. Okay. So let me start first of all. I I, I wanted to show first the map of uh, Africa and see show you where Congo is because this is. Uh, that will give you an idea of what uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, and uh, so in the sense uh, I'm trying to from this side where I'm showing here, this part here uh, you have Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, all this part is called the north of uh, Africa, 
And most of this part will use, uh, as we just heard from uh, uh, the uh, previous presenter, they will be using Arabic as language. So, and when you come down, you will see that mostly uh, the west part of Africa, this side, first of all, let's go here, all down here, that would be called the Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, there will be two main uh, international languages and cultures, which one? The West will be most predominantly, I would not say that most of the country, but most predominantly uh, French speaking uh, countries because many of the countries which are here were colonized by French people. And uh, except in Nigeria, which is there surely colonized by uh, uh, Great Britain. But many of the countries which are here will be, will be speaking French except South Africa, surely. But the country which will be on the other side of the Eastern part will be mostly English speaking country and many of them were colonized by uh, English people. So this is something very important because talking about neuropsychology, this will come very importantly. We do not have in Sub-Saharan Africa very well developed neuropsychology as per se, but much will be in the English speaking country. When I say in English speaking country, because this question comes easily, why? Because those who came from the United States or those who came from Great Britain easily came to this country and could bring the tests in English and start doing the tests with people, those who were educated. And also the way of the English in the colonization were helping those they were colonizing to easily get adapted to the language and to get a different type of education from England. That was not the same way in uh, French speaking country. So that's why you will see that neuropsychology is very well developed in South Africa. Um, Dr. Lingani and I are doing a kind of research to know uh, what's going on in terms of neuropsychology, but let me just give you an idea. So it will be mostly in South Africa. There will be some in Zambia, in Botswana. This, all that will be English speaking country. Uh, a little bit in Kenya and some will be in Nigeria. And in Ghana, we have only one neuropsychology, but in French speaking country, really neuropsychology per se does not exist in Africa. We do not have a, a good uh, program in neuropsychology or neuropsychologists there. So now the Congo where I am from is this, what was formerly called Zaire, this part. And this country beside was not colonized by French, were colonized by the Belgians. Okay, so it is one of, uh, it is the largest country in the Sub-Saharan Africa. Now you understand the expression Sub-Saharan Africa. And in terms of the population is the, uh, the fourth in uh, Africa. And as I said, it was colonized by, by the Belgian. But what is very important with uh, Congo is that uh, the language spoken is French. And uh, uh, because the Belgian could not uh, put themselves together to teach one of their languages to, to the Congolese, so they taught us French. And beside that, Congo has four national languages. So we have Lingala, Kikongo, Chiluba, and Swahili. And the country is linguistically divided in these four country uh, languages. And the country has 432 tribal languages. So each tribe has its own language. And beside the tribal language, you have to know the regional languages, one of the four I just said, and education is in, in French. And the educational system is that you have a kindergarten now, you are the primary school, after the primary school, you have a secondary school, you have a, what we will call graduate and after you have a licensiate and after you can have a master or PhD. And the educational system is a little bit different in the sense that it is not like an English system where you have A, B and C, but there is a out of 10. And from out of 10, you need to get a, a five is a passing grade. So that's, I'm giving that to tell you a little bit about neuropsychological tests in terms of effort. Because my way of being trained in the United States is that with the neuropsychological, the person give the best of uh, his or her effort. And if you were to count the best of the effort in the Congo, it means somebody will give you five out of 10. Meanwhile, in the United States, five out of 10 is not the best effort. 
So uh, it is to show you a little bit, I would like to say, this is a, a surgical table in the Congo and somewhere in a village area. When I saw this, it is to give you an idea when you are talking about bringing all your neuropsychological tests from the United States and an area like this one, this is the surgical table. So how will you bring all the CVLT and in this context, that's, uh, you have to be a very creative neuropsychologist to be in this, such a context. So the path to become a neuropsychologist, I will, as I said, in the Congo until now, I am the only one and the first neuropsychologist there. Neuropsychology, there is no master program or PhD in neuropsychology. There are just few programs in uh, clinical psychology, but even there are some classes in neuro, uh, uh, clinical psychologists. None of them, none of the program has a class in neuropsychology, none of them. The, there are just two, I, I did talk with INS, International Neuropsychology Society, to see if I can start. And uh, I thank the president of INS who helped me to get in touch with the University of Montreal. Uh, of Montreal. And this year, there will be two students from the Congo who did a master in clinical psychology who are going to do a, a, a master uh, in neuropsychology and probably a PhD in clinical neuropsychology so that they can join me and train the next generation of neuropsychologists. So far, what I've done is that since I'm in the University of Kinshasa, I've taught neuropsychology a class, uh, an introduction to neuropsychological syndrome. So I taught that class to the, the psychiatrist and uh, neurologist resident. And so that as a way for them who are the physician now to know what is neuropsychology and so that they can send some referral to me. And that's a way to spread neuropsychology. And also I'm teaching another class just to give a kind on or helping them to have a cognitive profile of neurological and psychiatric disorder. So they know that patient who have neurological and psychiatric problem can have an issue related to cognitive issue. So what are the main role of a neuropsychology? As I say, um, there is no clear role of neuropsychology yes in the Congo because um, it, it does not exist. And the medical community, many of them do not know who is a neuropsychologist and what is a, a neuropsychologist. I've been going here and there in different hospitals to train some physician to let them know what is neuropsychology and who is a neuropsychologist and what is the role of a neuropsychologist. So I'm really doing the, the work of a pioneer to teach people what neuropsychology is and what is a neuropsychologist. And uh, for some, they think that a neuropsychologist is a speed therapist. To others, they think that we are just psychologists who do therapy. So, and they, uh, they don't see any difference uh, uh, with the, the other psychologists. So what I'm doing now, a kind of a referral that I'm, I'm having, when I arrived in the Congo, the first thing I said, uh, because I've been training in the United States, I said, let me go to uh, an institution where probably uh, might have an idea of neuropsychology. So I went to one of a VIP clinic, which is a uh, Centre Medical de Kinshasa. So I went there, which is a, a French uh, uh, clinic. So at least they knew what is neuropsychology from France. And there that I've started, and many of the referrals I receive from neurology and cardiology, mostly stroke. Many of the people I'm receiving are stroke patients, those with epilepsy, and mostly with neurodegenerative disorders. In fact, that's what I, I am very much known now in the Congo in neuropsychology, it being known in the Congo, mostly in terms of neurodegenerative disorders. And I receive also some uh, referral, mostly from internal medicine, mostly from uh, metabolic disorder uh, syndrome. So these are the main sources of referral. Others can be there, but that is where I'm getting. So what are the strengths and the challenges of neuropsychology in the Congo? I, I think that the strength, the strength is uh, what I will say. Uh, I would like to, by studying about the strength, I would like to thank really personally Dr. Jakob Stern and Dr. Anthony Stringer, who have been very great to me, they told me when I was going back in the Congo, they said, since you will be the first and the only one, we allowed you, we want you to create the test before you go, you start. So create the test so that you start with the test for doing clinical work and research work. 
And that is the strength of neuropsychology in the Congo. We have a neuropsychological test that Dr. Anthony Stringer and myself created, which has been validated, I'm going to show that, uh, in local languages, taking into account the cultures. And what. So that is really the strength that neuropsychology has and will have in the Congo. Uh, the challenge is, is to start a master program in neuropsychology. Uh, this when I say, uh, because uh, ne I don't, neuropsychology is not yet accepted by the psychologists in the Congo, at the psychology. They find like neuropsychology, when I explain to them, it look like, it, it seems to be like a super physician. So they don't want uh, uh, neuropsychology in the department of psychology. I've done everything, but it is so difficult. I went in the school of medicine, but the physician, when I say I'm a neuropsychologist, they said, okay, you look like a psychologist, you don't belong to us. So uh, I'm still there trying my identity. There is no job description for a neuropsychologist yet in the Congo. Although there are a lot of things there, but there is no job description yet. But this, it is up to me and the next generation to create that job description and we are creating that already. And there is a, a very important challenge is the paradigm shift in neuropsychology. I've been trained from the West and uh, I'm bringing uh, this to Sub-Saharan Africa. The question remain whether uh, neuropsychological syndrome in the Sub-Saharan Africa are the same like the one we find here in the US. This is a very important uh, topic that my supervisor and I, my mentor, Dr. Anthony Stringer and others, we have been thinking whether the presentation of neuropsychological syndrome are the same in Africa, like the one I saw here in the United States. So what are the problem I encounter in the, uh, the translation of the development of, uh, I go quickly, um, I want you a little bit to say, the African culture to, to see the problem is to understand what the African culture is. African culture is an oral tradition, oral tradition culture. Meanwhile, here where I was trained is a written. And the second here, uh, there it is a we. That's why, for example, when I have to do uh, the clinical interview or, or whatever, it's become so difficult. It is not the person alone. It is the family which is there. We use a lot of metaphor, symbolism to communicate proverb and story. Meanwhile, here it is quite different. It is a, a gestalt rather than a detail. So. Now, when I'm giving a visual spatial test, am I going to expect to them to give me more gestalt or detail? That's, that's where the question start. And the importance of the traditional respect of elders, it is so difficult for you to, as a neuropsychologist, for someone in a big authority and someone who your elder to give the diagnosis because it looks like it's not respectful for that person. Okay, another thing very important uh, in uh, talking about the translation and neuropsychology in Africa is, as, as the previous presenter said, the concept of time. In Africa, there is no hurry. We, we would like to take things in the pace. Uh, we would don't say, okay, there is five minutes remaining. No, take your time. So how will you do a test to someone you're thinking that you want to time the, the, the person for processing speed the person does not have that concept of processing speed. It is the culture, I would say, and generally we, the culture, the training is, as I said, five out of 10. It is not 10 out of 10, like we are training here with nine out of 10. So, and also in terms of something uh, very important, showing the emotion, the difficulty with drawing, that's uh, something many people are not used to drawing. And if you special learning and memory test, we need to do a lot of drawing. Okay, there is less emphasis in the school for organization, planning and categorization. And some of our tests, the problem solving are using a lot of categorization, planning, even list learning tests. So the test we did, um, Dr. Anthony String and I, is the African Neuropsychological Barry Test and that test that will measure cognitive dysfunction in culturally and linguistically appropriate manner. So we use the culturally appropriate content. And this test has been, uh, we created it in English, we translated it in French, has been translated in Swahili and Lingala, Kikongo, Chiluba. And now we translated that in Kenya, Rwanda, a language in Rwanda. So this is the, what we did with the test. Um, 
for time reason, let me just go quickly. So this is uh, what we have. Let me not go. So most in language, we have the naming test. Uh, list learning, we have uh, learning and memory. So we have all these tests. And executive function, we have this test. And all these tests, I have to tell you, uh, it took me one year, my second year of my postdoc here at Emory, to create all these tests with my mentor, Dr. Anthony Stringer. So we were using stimuli from Africa, mostly from the Congo, and in the goal that these tests can be used in different countries of Africa and translated in different languages of Africa. That's why we have done in Rwanda. So there is the, a kind of the test. So the naming, we have objects which are typically African. And we, I mean, neglect, we have something this. And as I said to you, we, we have something more simple and for less educated people. Okay, so per, perceptual matching you have there. And the story, you, we don't have a story of Anna Thompson. We have the name uh, Malaika and Oyango, which are Swahili names and completely African names. And even in the list, we have categories which are from Africa. And for problem solving, we have a card which are play in Africa. And visual spatial memory, we use associative uh, visual spatial uh, memory. So to also to counter the problem of drawing uh, for time reason. So what are the problem we encounter? Some of the problem we have encountered is for example, the story. When we created the story memory test, we use uh, the phrase like it is used here. I'm going to say to you a story and after that, give me as you, you have learned. But when I have given that this test has been the most difficult one we validated, the result we got are more conflicting. I'm not presenting that them here, but one of the things we found was that the phrasing we use was very Western rather than using the one in, could be more in the Congo. So now we change the phrase. We will say, I'm going to read a story to you and I want you to tell me it back as you remember the word of a song. And since we change that there is some changes, we don't, I'm not presenting the data yet here, but there is a change. So you see our culture impact a lot. We are using more associative visual spatial memory rather than using uh, uh, picture people to draw because of the difficulty people are with drawing. And another thing that uh, Dr. Singh and I are having now is to create uh, a language test mostly to, to assess aphasia because of the problem reading, writing, expressive and comprehensive repetition. Why? Because when you make a test in English, you have to translate that in French, in uh, Swahili or Lingala. The more you translate, let me say that in French, la traduction est une trahison. In English is that translation is a betrayal. And mostly when you do tests with languages, you want it to be nicely translated, but the more you translate, it betray and you don't have that sense. And really knowing that many of the people you have to assess are either bilingual, trilingual, or they have four languages. So it becomes so difficult which language you have to assess. So let me stop there. And uh, there are many other things that I would like you and uh, you can ask more questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Ikanga, for that presentation on your work. It's always great hearing from you. I remember hearing you a couple of years ago at INS and I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, so we have a few questions here for the last 10 minutes or so. We're going to do a Q&A and sort of a dialogue between both of you. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and stop sharing your screen so we can see all of our speakers together here. Um, so in terms of, um, I think to kind of go back to Dr. Al Jaudi just for a minute, we can kind of cycle back because I think you were going to talk a little bit too about your perspectives on the challenges and sort of the experiences with translation and adaptation to, um, I guess, uh, nations that speak Arabic. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit to that since Dr. Ikanga was able to talk to that some? Um, it, it has been not easy. Uh, the different educational systems across the country uh, it is a barrier. Uh, the quality of education uh, across this large country has been a, a barrier to come up with the one unified neuropsychological test that we could have some confidence in its um, uh, be in, in it being uh, relevant to everyone. Um, they, um, I've done uh, a study for uh, 
for the epilepsy pre-surgical candidates where, where the need was most pressing at the time. Um, and um, I've used uh, word counts in Arabic. I've had trouble finding uh, word banks uh, that would give me the highest, the highly frequent, uh, uh, frequently used uh, words. Uh, I found some and I used that. Uh, there was a problem uh, in uh, choosing between the, the uh, really colloquial uh, Arabic or the formal. The formal uh, could be understood by many people, uh, but it's, it's more of the old Arabic. And, uh, but when it comes to Saudi Arabia, the, the more colloquial might be. So uh, we would be faced with that challenge. Do we want our test to be just relevant to Saudis or to Arabs around the, uh, around the world or around the Arabic uh, uh, region? Um, uh, these are some kind of some kind of problems, and uh, one main thing is that we came up with one for pre-surgical epilepsy candidates, mainly in adults. But uh, there's so much work needed for other patient populations, such as uh, elderly, whether it's movement disorders, for for example, the DBS surgery, or uh, younger ones where there is the, that national need for good psychoeducation and. Uh, assessment and school placement recommendations that uh, are really not very well uh, provided at this time. Yeah, it seems like it's a common theme across both of um, your experiences and work of like trying to be the most efficient in translating or adapting tests and thinking about broad audiences while also interfacing with nuances between even like Saudi Arabia and Egypt or like the neighboring countries and things like that. Um, so it's, I really appreciate the work that you're doing and you know, one day I hope to contribute to this effort as well. Um, in term, uh, a question for Dr. Conga from the audience, um, have you considered or have you done any work using the, the ANB to test immigrants of African origin or sub-Saharan African origin um, who have come to the US at all or has it primarily been work done there in Africa? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, in fact, uh, there is a, uh, I have to say, uh, none uh, did give me a grant mm -hmm. to do such a study. So I've done a study using the African Neuropsychological Barry comparing African American, Caucasian, and African immigrant who are here. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, there is an article that uh, I just finished writing that very soon will be uh, published to show the data and uh, the norms on that. That's awesome. Congratulations. I look forward to reading that. Thank that's you. great. Um, that's great. That's good to hear that that work's being done here too, as I know it's of interest um, to our audience and in general. Um, I guess one question I have for both of you, um, you know, since I guess, so you came, you know, from your home countries to the U.S. for training. Um, we have a lot, so no neuropsychology. We have a lot of attendees um, who are kind of across the professional range, but we tend to focus a lot on trainee development and sort of getting didactic experiences out to trainees. So I'm curious what advice you might have for even somebody like myself or for other trainees who might have interest in this work. What sort of advice would you give to them? And maybe each one of you can say something to that. Um, uh, when it comes to test adaptation for countries that are um, you know, non-Western, uh, yeah, all these like nuance, Things for I think that I uh, would recommend. Uh, sorry for sharing this, this um, screen, but I would recommend that uh, people would consider things like um, uh, low education, uh, things like uh, bilingualism, because um, it it is relevant to both. Um, for example, let's say Saudis or Arabs living in Arab countries and Arabs living in the U.S. or, uh, or worldwide, uh, we would find a lot. And uh, the, uh, the tests are either, are often um, normed for uh, monolinguals. Uh, but I imagine like we would in the future have a, a three kinds of samples, patient sample uh, or the clinical sample, the uh, monolingual and the bilingual sample. I, I could imagine like the norming process be something like that in the future. Um, and uh, uh, for trainees, um, I, I, coming back to being uh, bilingual and educated, I think that's where the world is going now with the 
globalization and uh, um, all the, all these um, uh, uh, sources uh, connecting together. So I think that's the way to go. For sure. Thank you. That's really helpful um, to like, like, hear that piece of advice. And I think I, I agree with sort of, you know, I think more and more we're going to have multilingual people in the world. So we need a neuropsychologist to see to serve that population. Um, what about, I'm just going to stop sharing your screen. What about you, Dr. Ikanga? Any advice? Oh, so uh, if I understood your question is uh, if someone like you were to come in a different culture, for neuropsychology, mostly the translation or adaptation, what should be done? Yeah, that that and or if somebody kind of like both in both of your cases, if somebody from a culture where neuropsychology is kind of growing as a profession um, or hasn't been recognized so much in the past due to various reasons, um, what sort of advice would you give to that person or to trainees in general who kind of have, have, have interest in the development of this? Um, for what I've learned is uh, that the piece of advice that I just gave, I said to you is what Dr. Jacob Stern told me said, uh, first of all, uh, learn the culture. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that is a very, um, I was training here. For me, the culture of neuropsychology is the culture that I got from the United States. Mm -hmm. But the culture in which I'm bringing neuropsychology is not the culture of the United States. So sometime, I want to be, I want things to be on time, the way they are here. I, uh, when I do clinical interview, I just want to get the answer I want to get quickly. And people will say to me, no, 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 please. I have something I would like to tell you. Maybe some important or not important. So, and uh, so to learn the culture, to learn the culture is not just for clinical purpose only in that sense of interview or whatever. But also, as I said to you, in the creating of a neuropsychological test, really, it's, it's, we need, Dr. Sling and I needed to read a lot on the African culture to understand it and to understand the people. And that is why when I was presenting that it is around all the elements that some of the elements I presented that, that our tests were built. So the more you know the culture, the more you can build a test. But also remembering that there is a relation between the environment and the brain. Mm -hmm. And that's a relationship between the environment and the brain that is very important that as a psychologist, as a, a neuropsychologist, we need to understand the impact of the brain, the, the, the environment on the brain and the brain on the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think these are both really important um, things. I think too, even from like probably person to person, right? Even with these batteries and things, it's still each person's experience is unique. And I think even more, we need to do a lot of research on these sort of individual differences um, that can be contributing. So um, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. I know, I know we're talking about rushing and things like that, which is sort of, you know, I think kind of more of a US centric culture thing to be like very precise on time. Um, but I do want to, you know, recognize everybody's time constraints for the participants and both of y'all because I know you're very busy and um, I know for you, Dr. Al Judy, it's late there in Saudi Arabia. So thank you for joining us um, today. Um, so I think we'll just conclude here, but I really appreciate um, the experiences that both of you did uh, or talked about today. And I hope that um, both our, our attendees today and then anyone who watches this recording gets something valuable out of the lecture. Um, so we'll stop the recording here. Um, if you don't mind, can we, would you mind say if we took a group picture with Annie and I after we stopped the recording? Does that sound sure. good? I think it'd be great if we can kind of publicize the recording. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for attending. Bye-bye.